Uh, it's an honor, my pleasure to be uh, with Professor Lewis Gordon. Somehow we've never met before, actually. So this is the first time we've really had a proper conversation. So, you know, I'm just going to get, I'm going to get straight into it, I think. Um, Fear of Black Consciousness, for me, it's been good actually reading a book because I've been on Audible a lot and I haven't actually read a full book for a long time. So it was nice to actually just sit down and read. So I'll oh, thank you for that. Um, and it was also nice, I think, because there's certainly been a lot of things which have come out about racism since uh, in the George post George Floyd moment. Um, but I think it's it's fair to question the quality of a lot. Sometimes a lot doesn't mean it's always all that great, right? So it was nice to have a book uh, from someone who's been at this for a while, uh, one of the most established and credible thinkers on on blackness, certainly. Um, in the academy. So I really appreciate that as well. So the first question I'm going to ask you is a question we always ask everybody with books. Why write the book, really? Ah, well, first I want to just say, uh, do a nater, mazel tov for the Black Studies program in the UK. I'm on the Black Studies listserv, I groove on it. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, an important, it's an important achievement. But as we know, the first, we got to make sure the first is not the last. <laughs> <laughs> not the last. Uh, yeah. That's hard though, believe me. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know, yeah. the UK is bad. The UK is, it's a, it's a, ooh, it's a tricky but, place. But the thing about um, why I write this book, as we know, everybody should ask that when they write any book, when they write any book. And ultimately, the, um, the question, I think, comes down to why I write this book in this way. Because the overall project, my work ultimately, is dedicated to the question of the human being's relationship to reality, the many unfortunate ways human beings attempt to avoid it. And among those ways of attempting to avoid it uh, are ways of bullying, constructing, and dehumanizing people into becoming categories of non-human things. Additionally, the concern about freedom and liberation has always been in my work. But I've also, because of this question about how we deal with reality, I also question the questioner. In other words, we gotta get some humility when we do our work and understand we don't know everything and that part of our work is learning together. So the question is why write this book this way? Because I've always been addressing these issues. Well, there are several things. The first reason is as we know, whenever there uh, are, issues of conflict, there are people who would like to make interventions that bring clarity to the situation and facilitate ways for people to move forward. And then there are the hustlers. And the hustlers work from the commodification of these, they're exploiters of these problems. And so there are people who wanna offer very packaged, neat, black and white, narrow answers to what are questions that at the end of the day underneath we know is ultimately about how we can live together with respect for each other, but also for those of us who are under the heels of oppression, dehumanization and disempowerment. Ultimately, it's also about us developing the fortitude, the courage, the, the vigor to be able to stand up and fight against our dehumanization. And if fighting against that dehumanization is a lie, then all is lost. So it means that if we know deep down we're fighting for what's right, then we shouldn't be afraid of taking on the difficult task of the truth. And so why right now? Because we're in a, a really intense age of misinformation, disinformation, and unfortunately, even among ourselves, among fellow black people, there's a problem of fetishized oppression. We need to find a way to have to bring out a clear understanding that oppression is something we are to overcome, eradicate, transform, not something for us to fetishize or for something for us to be finding ourselves locked in commodifying practices. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, we'll get, I want to get to like, some of the, the key like concepts of the book, because um, there's some really, like, really, really, really important critiques of whiteness, the system, etc. in there. And actually some of the ways you've written it, um, which we'll get to. But there's a question I want to ask, because COVID is a kind of thing which hangs over it. You had COVID, 
as an experience. Also, you still got misinformation. I imagine there's a lot of misinformation around COVID. So what, what, how has COVID kind of impacted the, how this book has come into the world, if you like? Well, you know, yeah, I've been struggling with long COVID it's six, mm-hmm. since March 2020. But in the midst of it, you know, one of the things, I'm sure you're, you're similar, part of it, because we are intellectuals, we're scholars, you know, even, you know, it'll be like a medical doctor going through an illness. The medical doctor is going to be studying it while going through it. Yeah. And as I was looking at it, I was thinking, man, this doesn't have to be the way it is. Yeah. Right? We are actually, I, it was so clear to me very early on that we're in the midst of multiple converging pandemics. Yeah. And the mistake people make is they try to look at a pandemic in purely uh, um, biological terms. But as we know, if we did not have a dysfunctional global situation of the privatization of power, of systems that are designed willfully to produce vulnerability, precarity, of a system that's designed to disempower people from their capacity to make their lives better, if we didn't have that, so many, this, this situation would not be. This could have been some isolated virus somewhere where proper measures were taken quickly and we were able to respond in a way that would have a lot more people alive than what we have right now. But the fundamental problem, and we, I've heard so many medical officials just say this, they just said straight up, the fundamental problem is the privatization of medicine. The fundamental problem is that when people are suffering, somebody could make a buck or a pound <laughs> or whatever currency off of it. And think of the obscenity. I'm, I'm speaking to you from the United States, but the obscenity of the fact that it is government resources that created infrastructure for the vaccines and the mechanisms we have. And then it quickly went into privatization to create a situation where so many people on the planet need, need these resources and they're being blocked from it to make sure a bunch of rich individuals, a bunch of rich companies get richer. That is cruel, it's obscene, it's immoral. I, there's a long list of infelicities I could use to describe that situation. But of course, they're connected to what I argue is a set of pandemics that have been on the way for 500 years, right? The willful production of the genocide of indigenous peoples, the willful production of the dehumanization and enslavement of people to the point where there were people working, literally laboring for, for with 100% tax on their labor. <laughs> And the list goes on, right? Um, hunger, all of these things, you know, it's crazy. Most of the world's problems right now, it's within our capacity to alleviate the misery that's around us. But we are hiding from ourselves the human involvement in these affairs. These are humanly produced problems and we need human solutions for them. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think I think it can't be a coincidence that the UK and the US are two of the hardest countries hit by the pandemic and they are neoliberalism personified, right? Like particularly the US, but we're going that's that way as well over here. Um, there is actually a lot about in the book about neoliberalism and uh, the dangers that neoliberalism that neoliberalism play and also the racialized nature, because I think a lot of that gets missed often is that actually neoliberalism, neoliberalism, like neoliberalism isn't just about in the individual isn't just about the rich it is there's a huge component of race and white supremacy that kind of underpins all of neoliberalism. Like you could literally couldn't have neoliberalism without whiteness um so i guess you want to talk a, a bit about that the neoliberalism as a quote which i i'd written down to my book forgot but something like neoliberalism doesn't doesn't look racist at first and then you start scratching the surface and you can see pretty quickly that it really is sure all the folks who defend liberalism and neoliberalism, they usually do so through some appeal to colorblindness. Mm -hmm. And they say that ultimately it's about an abstract moral individual, therefore it's not racist. That's what they say. That's what those critics say. And what I argue, not only in this book, but I've been arguing for years, is that that distorts political reality. Right now there are folks who wanna talk politics, but exclusively in moral language. Mm But politics is about power. So, you know, you could talk about, you could, you could say you mean well all you'd like. 
the fact of the matter is there's no, if you are just simply an individual by yourself, then your power, so to speak, is just simply where your body could reach. That's it. That's it. That's all there is. But if we understand that human beings live in a human world, we have created cultural language and through it, resources through which technologies, for example, in which I could be physically here, an individual. But the fact of the matter is we're able to communicate with uh, these 198 people who are logged on. And the, um, we can also beyond that, we can, thanks to the creativity from Ada Lovelace to Hadi Lamar, we can have the algorithm for a computer all the way to wireless technology to make us, although physically distant, socially close. The social world is the world of power. And the fact of the matter is what, what neoliberalism does is produces vulnerability by trying to delude us that we can be powerful by ourselves. But the fact of the matter is the social mechanisms, we human beings depend upon a world of the dissemination of power. power and that power affects how you appear, it affects things you can do. It doesn't really matter how supposedly physically healthy you are, if you don't have the conditions of possibility, if you don't have access to the mechanisms that would enable you to go through the world, whether it's from a job, to being a classroom where someone listens to you and I have seen this, right? The classrooms where like the woman is raising her head and uh, she says something and people ignore it. Then the dude comes up and he says something and suddenly, oh, wow, that's a good idea. And the, and the woman is like, I just said that, but that's an example of that kind of problem of, of, of misguided power. So what, what neoliberalism does is basically try to convince us that we could power, be powerful by ourselves and it distorts the issue. And I talk about neoliberalism, neoconservatism as well, and that's often overlooked, but neoliberalism basically says, I only see you as an individual, but here's the problem. I don't know the last time I have been racially discriminated against as an individual. When people re discriminate against you racially, they don't know who you are personally. They just know you black or you brown. <laughs> if, if a misogynist is gonna be jacked up towards women, they just know that's a woman. Yeah. If a homophobe is gonna go at it, that's all they're gonna see. A transphobe, that's all they're gonna see. So the fact of the matter is neoliberalism, epistemologically, and also at the level of politics, lacks the capacity to address the problem of racism precisely because it blocks the dominated, the oppressed subject from appearing in the actual relationship of their oppression. Yeah. yeah. And that's not made better by the fact that you mentioned this in the book, right? That there are black neoliberal champions, right? Like there are many of them, it, both all, all around the world that make it look like, well, look, if you have a black, I mean, our government, I say our, probably not the best word to use here, the government of the United Kingdom is the most diverse government the country's ever had, right? It's also the most racist probably in terms of actual policy. So these black and brown faces are kind of, I don't know, what would you say, masks for neoliberalism? I don't know, cheerleaders, do they, do they hide Do they hide the racist nature of neoliberalism? Well, I think the thing to, to think about is the grammar or the logic of the system, mm. you see? The problem is, if people don't question how a system functions, what its values are, they fail to see how it can actually negatively affect people. And I'll give you an example. If one takes the position that neoliberalism doesn't see race, gender, or anything like that, then it's very simple, right? It means then that, that the historical exclusion of women, people of color, et cetera, if you take that position, then it was not done with any malicious intent. So it presupposes the intrinsic legitimacy of the system. Then you say, oh, no, no, the system is legitimate. It's just for some reason, there's a kind of epistemological or knowledge ignorance. Somehow they just weren't aware. So you say, okay, now you're aware. Bring those people in. And here's the thing you quickly discover. discover. You see, they want to bring the people in they claim but they don't want to change the game. But what if the game was designed for the exclusion of those people? Then it means when you bring in the women or you bring in the, the, the person of color, 
it means the game that was designed for their exclusion means it's going to invisibilize them by making them an exception to their group, which is a racist point. It means the group is still in, supposedly inferior. It's just this one is different. Yeah. And we already know this, right? So this is why peppering the government with a few people of color doesn't change, the fact, change what a racist government is. It just, because it's based on the premise of them being exceptional, which means their people are con considered still dastardly. So the thing about it then is quickly women who have been in that situation realize, oh, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be here. I'm an anatomical female, but I'm supposed to be here as a dude. Or, or, or black folks come in and say, yo, what they're really saying is I'm physically here, but I'm supposed to be here as a white man. And so that is the point about racism. You see, so the, the fact of the matter is one has to change the game. And what is changing the game is not only the fact that the, of the political work that many women and men and people who are non-gender binary, et cetera, have done over the years to, to get people in the room, but now we face an additional task, which is that if we're gonna change the game, we have to rethink what we mean when we say there are people in the room, what human beings are. If we look at human beings as individualized, isolated things, the game continues. But if we look at human beings as not beings, but as living realities and relationships facing conditions, now we know we got to change the game because we've got to change the conditions. Yeah. And if we change the conditions, we have to realize we also change ourselves. There's the, the moment it is just mundane and ordinary for you and me and many other people who are people are phobic toward today, the moment it's just ordinary for us to be in the room, that means a lot of us has changed and it means new relationships are developing. Yeah. I mean, it's because it's, it's, I, I wasn't going to ask this because my mom has told me not to crit criticize Obama anymore. And I promised her, <laughs> I, said that, but I, I, I promised I would do, but I, I keep doing it. So <laughs> if my mom is listening, I'm going to apologize again. Because you do, you raise Obama, and Obama's really interesting, because I think it's interesting on this idea of Black consciousness. And the argument I, th I think you make in the book is that he's Black physically, but, but does Obama, well, I ask you, does Obama have a Black consciousness? Well, there are several things. I talk about it in two ways. Mm -hmm. For some people to feel safe around Obama, they need him to have a Black body, but not a Black consciousness. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons why Obama had to write these autobiographies assuring people that he has a Christian consciousness. And I talk about how Christianity plays an important role in the production of racism in the Euro modern world. Um, whatever Christianity was, many variations, the fact of the matter is the Christianity we have inherited is actually a religion of war that says you must eliminate any difference. And so within that framework, announcing that he's a Christian was subtextually raising the question of, of, of an expectation of a certain identification. But Obama was also raising a, another thing that people are afraid of. And it was something that was done to someone, I'm, I'm speaking to you on Martin Luther King Day, and it's something that was done to the, the, the image of Martin Luther King, not the historical man Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King Jr. was a political man of moral integrity. Yeah. He fought, he, he knew his imperfections and it's no accident he died in the middle of a sanitation strike. Yeah. And also that he was fighting against, you know, <laughs> the, the massacring of people in Vietnam. Mm. But, the, but, but the fact is the transform Martin Luther King makes him seem like just a moralistic dreamer. <laughs> and when you think about say Malcolm X or El Malik Al Shabazz, yeah. even though he was a religious leader, you think about him as political. So here's the thing, what neoliberalism also does is want us not to think about the political because the political requires power and let us moralize and think about things in a reductive moralistic way. So that transformation was to construct Obama as a moralistic figure. Similar thing was done with Mandela, by the way, because there was a fear of him genuinely being a political figure because this is one of the things, you know, as a person in black studies, the two words that are really feared together, the word black with the word 
power. When they hear black power, it's like, oh Lord, oh man, they have to get me on. And they start about violence and blah, 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 blah. So the whole project was to make sure that the moral figure, Barack Obama, mm -hmm. is as politically impotent as possible. And this is a more complicated way of looking at the situation. And we see the narcissistic rage because you see, it was not simply enough for Obama to be succeeded by a white man, mm -hmm. but by a buffoon. <laughs> because if you think about it, there was a need to say a white buffoon, a fascist buffoon is somehow either equal to or superior to this black man who speaks multiple languages, <laughs> studied actually, you know, I already know because, you know, I've taught in elite institutions here. I already know that, for instance, Trump didn't write his papers. His sons can't even write. They pay people to write their papers. These are stupid. These are academically um, incapable people. Yeah. But but the people who would like that system to, 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 to function with its um, double standards, they yeah. sleep better at night, not if, an excellent, extraordinary, achieved, creative white individual succeeded Obama. Mm -hmm. They needed the buffoon, if you think about it. So there is, I, I don't like to analyze Obama by himself. Mm -hmm. You know, just like I don't like to talk about human beings by themselves. Yeah. <clears throat> I see Obama as part of a continuum of a disastrous effort of the ration, to rationalize the privatization of power through moralizing political work, the political world, instead of addressing power and the complexity of political responsibility. Yeah, no. um, certainly, yeah. I mean, I think well, I think one of the things that comes across in, in your work is um, your heritage, heritage, heritage Jamaican, right? And there's obviously Stuart Hall, Jamaican intellectual, um, who talks about popular culture, cultural studies, and kind of sh shifts and says that popular culture is really important for understanding where we are. And you do that in a number of places in the book, different movies, uh, music, and I really like the the way you get out um, and this idea of the body because there's so much of your book is about the body and separate from the mind and how you know whiteness is really hollowing out and wants the body but doesn't want the mind doesn't want the consciousness. I guess was that was that a, you do there's a lot in your work, but I, I guess what is the power of culture and kind of explaining some of these things, some of these concepts in a more relatable kind of way? Well, you one of the things that went should notice not only in this book but in my entire work and which is one of the things that has made things um, difficult uh, um, for me at times because a lot of people like neatly packaged the stuff that works for hustlers but the but the but the fact is the human world is more complicated and global and i'm a relational thinker so for instance even the um the jamaica i'm from as we know the caribbean is a, a highly mixed society while at the same time being a highly African area of the world. And so, and I was lucky in that world because I knew like my great grandparents, my great, great grandparents, my great grandfather died when he was 110. I knew people who just sitting on their lap could tell me stories all the way back to the early 19th century. And the thing that I learned, whether, whether it's my paternal Chinese grandmother, whether it's through my uh, Sephardic and Misraki maternal grandmother, through the Tamils, through the Ethiopians, because I was lucky to actually know where my family is from. I even know the places, Pondicherry, India for the Tamils, you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. Jerusalem for the ones who left uh, in 19th century. Um, but the point I'm trying to lead up to is that global sensibility made me always realize that we're always in a world bigger than ourselves. And similarly, I brought that to the way I look at disciplines and study. You may notice I look at culture broadly. There's nowhere in this book or in any of my writings where I would say, for instance, uh, and mind you, I love Shakespeare, but I wouldn't say it is only good if it's Shakespeare or if it's only good if it's Plato or it's only good if it's Aristotle. Yeah. Because I read Surya Rabindo. I have a little, one of his books behind me and uh, Nishitani Kaiji, I read Kwasi Wirudo, the rest in peace, he just recently passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, Zara Yaakob in Ethiopia, in other words, and from Jamaica. And in fact, if, you know, if we had started with music, I would have been playing Linton Kwasi Johnson because he's a poet, but yeah. I consider the brother a philosopher, especially yeah. I love the reality poem. And my point 
the point I'm leading up to is that we're always creating texts and ways of communicating. And those texts are films, records, comic books. They're also philosophical treatises, their essays, their newspapers. And what I do is I bring them in, but also many people lose sight that there are also stories being retold. You may notice throughout the book, I talk about the mythic history behind the story. So, so even though I talk about films like Get Out, like in Get Out, one of the things, I, one of the reasons I talk about Get Out, a lot of people think I talk about the films to endorse them. I actually don't talk about the films to endorse them. I talk about the films because I know people have seen them. Yeah. And in the way I talk about them, introduce them into another world of how to talk about these. So like Get Out, there are people who say people hate the black body, but Get Out shows people desiring the black body. Yeah. They just don't want the black mind to be in the black body. <laughs> And uh, lots of films, you know, Sorry to Bother You, I point out how the mythic history that goes back, Sorry to Bother You, is a retelling of stories that go back several thousand years. But because I studied classics and I also studied ancient African, you know, um, literature, I can see those. Like, this is one of the reasons why my kids sometimes hate going to movies with me, because sometimes three minutes in, I'm like, okay, I know what's going to happen. And they're like, oh, come on, dad, don't say anything. And the, and the reason is because I know the myths. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. know where this is going. And so, yes, the point is uh, in this text, all of these are in an equal playing field because they open us up to communicate and think critically. And that's what I'm inviting the reader to do. In fact, Jamaica Kin Kincaid gave me, said something very nice to, last week. She said to me, um, you know, Lewis, you're not trying to please the reader. You're trying to engage them. And I think that's, and, and I, I stopped, I said, you know, Jamaica, you're right. You know, that's a really precise, that's an accurate way of saying what I try to do in my writing. Yeah. Because I do think it's patronizing simply to try to please people. You want them to be able to think for themselves. And our task is to offer some resources that could also maybe enable them to be critical of me. Mm -hmm. And if they're critical of me in a very useful way, you know what I say? Thank you. It means I learn how to do what I do better. Yeah. Um, I want to get. Uh, I'm going to get go to the Q and A in a second to make sure people get a chance to ask, ask questions. So if you do have a question, just type it in the Q and A box. Um, but I did want. I, I, you know, I did want to push back slightly on one thing. Thinking about being critical. Um, Black Panther. I mean, we have very different readings of this film. I won't go into my long critique of Black Panther. The question I want to ask is. Thinking about Black consciousness, given everything around Black Panther, the, the origins of it, the commercialization of it, everything about it, is it, a, is it the best place to look for a, a, a progressive Black consciousness? I guess that's a big question in a, in a short, in a short. Yeah, the, none of, the, none of the, um, the places, none of the texts I analyze are films mm -hmm. are necessarily the best place. Mm -hmm. It's their popularity that makes them very good meeting places. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the thing. And the, and the complicated thing with the Black Panther is there's so many later, layers in that film. And you may notice that um, I also bring, not only in terms of how I look at it in terms of antiquity, yeah. but also in terms of the, the really prescient Richard Wright. Mm -hmm. Richard yeah. Wright and Fanon basically raise some very important questions. And they're these ironic moves. I like the fact that the villain isn't clearly the villain. Yeah. And I do like, there are certain elements that I could tease out from there. The distinction, for instance, between having an actual tyrant, someone who is unilaterally dictating power mm -hmm. versus a community in which one can be critical and even laugh at the national leader. But the thing about it, but but you already know, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, the analysis I give of the Black Panther is pretty long. <laughs> but 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 one of the things I raise throughout, because it's after my discussion of black consciousness is political, mm -hmm. is a lot of people want to have a black, because they're still steeped in neoliberalism, a black conscious individual. Yeah. But but I like putting on the table what a black conscious in the sense of uppercase B, not lowercase B, Black consciousness, but the agent 
historical liberatory black consciousness. So just maybe just explain the difference quickly because I think that would be- Sure. A... Lowercase b black consciousness is the black consciousness constructed, the black constructed by a world that's anti-black. And that's the stuff that tends to just treat black as negative, ontological, all that stuff. It's the, the stuff that a lot of, unfortunately, the Afro-pessimists groove on. They say the black is not human, the black is this, blah, blah, blah. They're locked in first stage double consciousness. That's where you could only see yourself through the eyes of those who hate you. However, there's a point at which you realize, wait a minute, there's something wrong with a society that makes me into a problem. What if that society is the problem? Should any society be a society that makes people into problems instead of addressing the problems they face? The moment you do that, you're now in a dialectical critique of the society. And this leads to what Jane Anna Gordon calls potentiated double consciousness. And potentiated double consciousness is the uppercase B black consciousness. This is where you say, I'm gonna be an actor, an agent of history. And even, even if when I'm fighting, I individually lose, the fact that I'm standing up for my dignity and respect and I have the commitment, I've already won. In other words, the commitment to a world that's premised upon the respect and dignity, not only for black people, but a better understanding for people overall that's the uppercase B, Black consciousness. But to do that is political because it means transforming power. And I, I usually illustrate it through just bringing up, you know, how people misread Audre Lorde. Because when, you know, Audre Lorde says the master's tools can't tear down the master's house, they're busy thinking that the master had created the tools and created the house. But as history shows us, it was the enslaved people. It was our creativity who built, that built houses. So why don't we build other houses to make the master's house so irrelevant, it can't even function as a master anymore. And so that building of better houses, Black Studies is the project of building a better disciplinary home. Yeah. That's the uppercase B, Black consciousness. And I argue that is built on a political community. Yeah. So that is, that's what I want to tease out. Not whether Black Panther had it right, but that it put on the table a question that we now need to er interrogate what it is to build a political community. Yeah, yeah that's actually a good way to end this part of the, the, the conversation. I'm gonna to go to the, to the Q&A. If you do have any questions, uh, just drop them in. Uh, the first one I'm gonna take is from Carolina that says, uh, the fetishization of indigenous struggles is something in which indig indigenous people also participate, which, in opinion, uh, which weakens the legitimate demands for justice. Mm -hmm. What strategies for reflection does the intercultural dialogue between different oppressions and the dangers of fetishization offer us? That's wonderful. Could we, could we also take another one? That way, yes. we because I think that, that way the audience could learn from their, their questions. Yes, okay, I'll give you the second one, uh, which is, uh, did it. yeah, so there's a quote, Lewis writes, it's not the body that frightens them, it's the fear of, special, of a special kind of consciousness looking back at them, black consciousness. Uh, so is the black consciousness that you refer to similar to what some term as political blackness in the UK? Uh, okay, so I'll go backwards. The second one is easy to answer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? In fact, that goes all the way back to Biko and many others, right? Yeah. There are people who are afraid of black people having agency. They want to patronize us and, and make us dependent on them. In fact, they want to lock us into a dialectics of recognition, the anti-black yeah. you know, position in which, for instance, that we cannot serve as building standards of our own. We have to seek their approval all the time. And that's nonsense. It's mm -hmm. political black consciousness say, look, be active, build a better world. Now, in terms of the fetishization of indigenous struggles, um, one of the things to bear in mind is, this is what I was hinting at. Um, I understand why some people on a certain level want a kind of will to power by, that says, by virtue of my identity and it alone, I have power. The problem is it's a fraud, it's seductive. And the reason it's a fraud and it's seductive is because no human being is actually one identity. Human beings are a constellation of relationships and the identities are always being transformed in their meaning. You take communication out of human existence and you have a disempowered, isolated thing. So the thing about what we have to do is actually, it's not simply about the kind of liberal model of, yo, let's dialogue. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. No, it's about actually understanding that when you're involved in working with other people, one is also simultaneously powerful and vulnerable. 
And that vulnerability is in the communicative practices through which if you're really communicating, you're also transcending yourself because you're fighting for something greater than yourself. And that means that, for instance, the indigenous people to come, the black people to come, or maybe something new, people who are neither black or indigenous, who knows? Mm -hmm. The many to come may be part of a world that is different from ours, but depend upon our actions for them to come into being. And we would have done our work right, so to speak, if they're able to look back at us. And instead of saying, damn, why did they do that? Instead, they're saying, thank God you acted. And this is the task we have with political work because we're often fighting for people we'll never know. They're anonymous, but we also have to recognize their right to be able to be and live in a world that is meaningful for them. And that's something Fanon argued, by the way, too. But I'll, I'll leave it at there. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll give you another couple. Uh, this is from Pauline, important one actually, because he's basically saying, given everyone talks about neoliberalism, uh, someone who's concerned with what these terms actually mean, uh, I'd be interested to know uh, what neoliberalism is in simple terms and where does it come from? So basically, what is neoliberalism? What do we mean when we say it? And then the second one is from Dan. He says, does changing the game mean a quest for utopia? Uh, such a quest can impart energy and vision, but it can be dismissed as impractical. So is the mundane more important than the utopian? Okay, I'll go backwards. I'll start with that one. Okay. Um, one, one, one problem we have had with a lot of theorizing, and I talk about it not only in that, this book, but many of, the, many of the others, is that we tend to be locked in loaded questions and false dilemmas. And so if we become purely formal or we set up as the criterion perfection, the problem is the same things that lead to purity and superiority and all those notions. Those are logics that require the outcome before performance. In the human world of action and politics, performance is not ideal. It is relational and it's always being transformed. So what I actually argue for is instead of uh, utopia or the ideal, I argue for reasonability. In other words, what makes sense in a very pragmatic and, and lived reality of what we can do. Now, to understand this, this leads to the earlier point about neoliberalism, because you see, the way people often talk about the right and the left and you know, revolution and fascism, they talk about them as blanket terms, but they never get into the nuance of why, why people actually adhere to them. The way I talk about them is through looking at crises. If you, all a crisis means you're in a situation where you have to make a decision. And as we know, there are often people who are afraid of making decisions. People who are afraid of making decisions would rather be at, in an imagined time when things were perfect, when everything seemed to work, when they were safe, when they were order. So they then to move more to the right. Almost all conservatism and right-wing stuff is about order, tradition, security, blah, 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 blah. And they often try to present difference, any form of uncertainty, contingency as dangerous. So and that's why they tend to invest in the police. And they're over obsessed with laws, et cetera. And as we know, if you push that to the extreme, uh, you go from conservatism to neoconservatism, and then you go from neoconservatives because neoconservatives see themselves as having an enemy. The enemy is disorder, creativity, dissent, et cetera. And, and eventually they cannot tolerate any difference so they could only be around people who are exactly like themselves and they have fascism. Now, liberalism puts everything into opinion and try to say, yo, you know, I cannot judge for others. It's about my opinion, where I'm located. There is no real, you know, th th there's a limit out, out there. But the problem is the liberal versus the conservative and the neoconservative and the fascist the neoconservative fascists who say, yeah, liberal, be liberal, tolerate me while I try to destroy you. I'll jack you up. Then you have the neoliberals. So I'm talking about it this way, right? The neoliberals and the conservatives, they tend to meet in their valorization of capitalism. 
And because neoliberals valorize capitalism, they treat capitalism as the solution to everything, they tend to valorize privatization. And when they and, and you could see the consequence of valorizing privatization leads to a kind of individualism in which they claim that they're protecting civil liberties for individuals. But as I pointed out, the, the, the bulk of dehumanization is not about individuals, they're about groups. So neoliberalism is basically the idea that you can individually, you can, you can individually act and you can privatize the world. And that means that neoliberalism is willing to tolerate and in many cases maintain radical forms of inequalities. Now, from there, you can get into leftism. There are different kinds. There's anarchic leftism, but the problem with anarchic leftism is they're anti-status, they're anti-anything that represents authority to the point where they slide into the individualism that is like neoliberalism. And even further, they may slide into forms of fascism. And it's, that's why there's no accident you've seen in certain forms of politics, libertarians and even anarchists meeting with fascists and conservatives. But then there's another kind of leftism. The other kind of leftism says, yo, Every time I look at the past, it was never perfect. It was just people trying to make the world better. Yeah. All the current crisis is, is our turn to try to make the things better. We're not gonna do it perfectly, but we're gonna try our best. And that's why it's not utopian, but it's not nihilistic. It's not pessimistic and it's not optimistic. It's about a commitment to do what we can. And that kind of leftism has at its heart, the notion of political responsibility and the idea of the, of the social world of power. And there, the fight is against disempowerment. If you think about it, all racism, dehumanizations are disempowerment. It's to say black people should have no power if it's anti-black racism, to empowerment, but empowerment is in the form of realizing that ultimately, if you're going to fight against the privatization, the global privatization of power, the antidote, is going to be the public alternative. And that requires a different globalism, a different understanding of power. And it's power that can address real issues like climate change, like species extinction, like pandemics, and the list is long. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to group a few questions together. So, because they're asking a similar thing. So, one of them, Jay asked, Do you feel that the political activism of NBA players over the last few years is a, leg is a legitimate expression of Black consciousness? or something less genuine, uh, which ties into a general, there's a few questions about, you know, what's happened to the black consciousness, like in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and where we are now. And then there's a specific question, where is it down here, which says, what do you think of the view that areas like black studies are, are a way to dampen revolutionary action and make the black experience conform within the current culture? So yeah. I hey, yeah. okay, well the, well, the first thing to bear in mind is when I say fear of black consciousness, it's a fear of dealing with truth and reality. Mm -hmm. There are people who want to bully us into giving, for instance, rosy histories of the country's past, whether it's in the UK, whether it's in Sweden, whether it's in the United States, Canada, India, all over the place. Brazil, Brazil has a vehement, horrible history of anti-black racism with the branquiamento policies and all over Latin America. There are a lot of those things are there. Or if we deal with what the untouchables are facing in South Asia, mm -hmm. again, those are all forms of anti-Black racism. So truth is to call it what it is and begin to address the problem. Now, here's the thing. Those NBA players, within the framework of where they live, you know, what they're doing, they're calling it what it is. Whether it's NFL people, sports people, they're calling what it is. When I talk about Black consciousness, I'm talking about it as a very human political phenomenon. So I'm not talking about it as a closed system. I'm talking about it as an ongoing effort. There are degrees, there are different ways. Mm. When I, we, so we, yeah, NBA players and celebrities, they're high profile, but I'm particularly interested, and I talk about it in the book, I'm particularly interested in the people who people think nobody's interested in talking to. Mm. People like, you know, our, 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 our mothers, our fathers, our cousins, the people who are going out to be custodial workers, the people who are maybe just trying to get their education in school, getting through things, the people who may be undocumented workers moving around. 
everything is telling those people they have no power whatsoever. But, but we need to articulate a conception of political action that actually shows why their ability to act is necessary. So although it's cool, the symbolic level to have, whether it's an Obama as a president or a, a Mandela in South Africa, or whether we're talking about you know, Kamala Harris as a vice president, all those things, or we talk about importance of LeBron James, the list is long, that's cool. And they do manifest forms, but, but they're only part of the story. The global political reality has to come down to the everyday people, how they can act and change the world. And that goes full circle to the question you asked earlier. It's why I try to look into things that everyday people engage, whether it's movies, whether it's going to be the, when they go on a trip somewhere, whether it's what they encounter when they're pulled over by a police officer. Those are real everyday things. But the, one of the things that's always struck me and that's one of the reasons why you notice in the book, some of the examples I pick are people who died thinking they failed, but their action was a necessary condition for what was to come. So ultimately then, and this is the part where I make a distinction between utopia, the idealistic stuff and reasonability, what we actually do throughout this entire book and into, throughout my entire work. When I talk about existence and black struggles, I'm talking about real people what's involved in what we do, and what is to come. Um, there was a couple of questions about Afro-pessimism specifically. Uh, one specifically from uh, Mangalika, who asks about uh, Frank Wilderson's critique of the category of race and racism as a category of analysis in favor of anti-Blackness, uh, which illuminates the phenomenon insight of the Black occupying the zone of non-being. So I guess, like, yeah, what, what, is there any utility in um, Afro-pessimism? Um, Afro-pessimism is making its uh, mark all over the place, but I've uh, written particularly uh, in my Freedom, Justice, and Decolonization book, my critique of it. Uh, and the problem I have with Afro-pessimism is the problem I have with pessimism and with optimism. You see, the existential argument I make is about political commitment, which transcends pessimism and optimism. They also horribly misread Fanon. <laughs> oh my God, it's terrible readings of Fanon. First of all, first of all, Fanon's given a critique of ontology. You see, his, his point about, about white consciousness or white whiteness is that human reality, human beings are not beings. We're not ontological things. What, what white supremacy and anti-Black racism do is to construct a category of people as gods, as ontological. So they walk around as beings. Fanon, Merleau-Ponty, Sartre, all the way through to people like Biko or myself, we argue that that is not a human being. So for the Afro-pessimist to claim the white is the human being, the black is not, they misread the text. The critique is that the whites are attached to a value system that dehumanizes them as well. The zone of non-being then is an attack on black people to say you are lacking because you're not being. But here's the point. The zone of non-being is the realm in which a human being transcends being and thus as an existent can be creative about reality. That's why in a lot of the black world, there are whites who even look envious on black people and say, damn, we beat them. We do all these horrible things to them. But man, you know, black people seem to know how to live. Even with limited resources, there's soul, there's joy, there's affirmation of life. What the hell is that? Mm -hmm. And the answer is existence. The, the answer, in other words, is that uppercase B black consciousness. It's an understanding that even though the world may batter you, it's up to you to fight against that and say, I will not be defeated. The existential irony is sometimes the person who may win the battle is the real loser. Because ultimately, you're a loser if you could only claim to win by being a bully. So ultimately, the, the misreadings of someone like Fanon, Fanon is very explicit. The goal is to be actional. And to be actional is to move outside of a world that's Manichaean of black and white, that treats white as full positivity and black as full negativity into dialectical world of communication in which there's never a universal, there is 
the universalizing practices that are never complete. And that is, of course, what we call life existence and also the struggle for meaning. So there's a lot more I could say, but yeah, the Afro-pessimists grotesquely misread Fanon, but they also, I think, connect into that fetishism that earlier questioner asked. Because if you fetishize blackness, you have dehumanized us and you've closed, closed off the possibility through which we could create creative forms of meaning. And they may even transcend blackness as we know it. 